you are looking at Dragon standing proudly over 20 stories high on top of Falcon at our launch facility at Kennedy Space Center, just next to Cape Canaveral in Florida, where we are just 20 minutes away from the live launch of CRS-10 to resupply the International Space Station. Now here at the headquarters in Hawthorne, California, it's 6.45 a.m., so good morning. My name is Brian, and I'm one of the software engineers here on staff. You can see the crowd gathering behind me, as well as the operators inside of Mission Control just beyond. Now, we at SpaceX are honored to have the opportunity today to fly out of Pad 39A for the first time as a company. Now, if Pad 39 sounds familiar, it should, because it was from those hollowed grounds that man first launched to step foot on the moon. It was thereafter taken over by the space shuttle program, and ironically, one of the first pieces of what would become the ISS was launched during those days. And here we are 30 years later with the same opportunity to make fire from 39A again. We'll also be showing another landing attempt back at LZ-1 during the daytime, so we should bring some miraculous views. So let's get started. Good morning, this is Tom Prodario from the avionics department here at SpaceX. And as you heard, we are launching from historic Pad 39A today in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Now this launch pad is actually just about a mile or so away from our other launch site at Space Launch Complex 40. Uh, however, that's at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base. This is just across the channel in the Kennedy Space Center, which is uh, owned by NASA. So SpaceX has leased this pad from NASA, and over the past few years we've been modifying it to support our Falcon 9 architecture. Uh, so let's just take a quick look, a real basic look at what you're seeing on your screen. The center white tube right in the middle here, kind of shrouded in fog, that is the Falcon 9 rocket. That is what is launching in just a few minutes. The Falcon 9 rocket has three parts to it. The bottom is the first stage, uh, makes up most of the rocket. Then there's the second stage on top of it. And then this very tiny piece uh, on the top, that's the Dragon spacecraft. So this whole rocket is launching just to get this little piece into orbit. And inside that, uh, that Dragon spacecraft, that's packed with all the supplies that we're bringing to the International Space Station. Uh, so there are a few other things that are going on in this pad. Um, this big uh, gray kind of rectangular structure behind the rocket, this is called the fixed service structure. This actually dates back to the Apollo era. It's what the Apollo astronauts used to ascend to the top of their Saturn V rocket uh, before blasting off to the moon. And then the other uh, big kind of rotating structure over here, this is called the rotating service structure. Uh, this whole structure actually used to kind of clamp around on top of the shuttle so they could load payloads into the payload bay. Uh, we don't use that though. Uh, hopefully, though, we'll be getting some SpaceX astronauts uh, loading into a Crew Dragon not too far in the future. Uh, so you'll be able to follow along as we get closer to countdown with the mission progress bar down at the bottom of your screen. We'll be counting off all of our objectives, and you can follow along there. And then, of course, there is the mission countdown clock in the top upper right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, as this clock approaches zero, the Falcon 9 is going to get ready to launch. The strong back is going to retract, and hopefully the Falcon 9 uh, will be blasting off just after 7 o'clock a.m. Pacific time. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Tice and I'm here in Hawthorne, standing just outside of our Merlin engine assembly area. We are just a few minutes before Falcon 9 blasts off to low Earth orbit to tag up with the International Space Station, which orbits our home planet about 250 miles above us. If you're thinking, that doesn't sound so far away, you're right. That's about the distance from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia. Um, the space station is actually visible to the naked eye. As, mo as most of you might know, uh, but for the knowledge of our newer or younger space fans watching today, when the International Space Station passes above you at night and the solar panels, solar panels reflect sunlight, the International Space Station looks like a very slow shooting star. A simple Google search can tell you when the next visible passes will be in your area. And if you happen to catch it within the next two days, look for the faint light that is chasing the International Space Station. That's our Dragon playing catch up to the station. Going up in Dragon today is about 5,000 pounds of cargo, which varies from research experiments to astronaut food and exercise equipment. The experiments being done up there aren't just for the astronauts of future missions of Mars and beyond. It also benefits those of us that stay down here. For example, life on Mars is tough because there's little protection from the sun's harmful radiation. Earth, however, has sunblock built in, the ozone layer. It sits about 10 to 30 miles above the Earth's surface and shields all forms of life from solar radiation. The ISS has a unique vantage point to our ozone, and one of the experiments on board Dragon today aims to take advantage of that unique position. The Stratospheric Aerosol and Gas Experiment 3 ISS, also known as SAGE, 
Sage 3 uh, is an instrument that will be mounted to the exterior of the International Space Station to scan the ozone horizon line and collect data about the fluctuations in this protective layer. Now, if you've seen videos of the ISS uh, scanning Earth, you've probably seen that. Good morning, everybody. I'm John Federspiel, a lead mechanical design engineer here at SpaceX, and it truly is an honor and an awesome privilege to be sharing this inaugural launch from Pad 39A with you for our 10th commercial resupply services mission to the International Space Station. Now, I've been sitting up here at our webcast desk, keeping an eye on the countdown and listening into the nets. Uh, and the good news right now is we are go to continue entering to the count. Uh, we are tracking an issue with the uh, thrust vector control actuators on our second stage. But as of this moment, we're proceeding into the countdown process, uh, sitting about T minus 15 minutes at this moment in time. Uh, right now, uh, on that Falcon 9 that you can see on the pad on the side of your screen, uh, we just finished off our loading of the RP-1. That's the refined kerosene on the vehicle. We finished that off about 15 minutes ago. We began the entire repellent loading sequence at the T-minus 73-minute mark. Uh, that's when our launch director pulled all of our team to enter into the auto sequence uh, process. That's where the vehicle begins its uh, sequence of maneuvers that it autonomously goes through to uh, go through the, the fuel and uh, liquid oxygen loading process. Right now, we are in a pause of our uh, propellant loading as we're starting to onboard the cryogenic helium onto the first and second stages. We're going to resume our liquid oxygen loading at roughly the T-minus 10-minute mark uh, and continue loading the liquid oxygen onto the vehicle uh, right up until about the T-minus 3-minute mark. We do try and load that liquid oxygen uh, right up to the very end of the entire process to keep that liquid oxygen as cold as possible. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, we are taking Dragon to the National Space Station. Uh, the Dragon spacecraft uh, did give its go at that T minus 73 minute mark. No issues there to report as well. Uh, and that team is go and ready to get to the space station. Uh, looking at the weather, uh, it's a uh, few clouds on the screen there. Looking at about 10 to 15 mile an hour winds on the launch pad. No issues there to report at the moment. Uh, weather is green for today's launch. Uh, range is also green for today's launch. Uh, going from pad uh, 39A should be all good to go. Today is an instantaneous launch window. Our backup is tomorrow, but for right now, all systems are go from Cape Canaveral. Now, we're referring to today's mission as CRS-10, and we refer to all of our previous missions as various numbered CRS missions that you've heard us say in the past. Now, CRS stands for Commercial Resupply Services, and that's really the underlying factor of every single one of these primary missions. It's for Dragon as a spacecraft to be able to resupply the International Space Station. What does that mean? It means bringing cargo up on ascension. Now, Dragon, as we refer to it, as a spacecraft in its entirety is actually composed of two separate pieces. It's the capsule and the trunk. Now on your screen you see a photo of Dragon with its wings, its solar rays spread, but the top section, the nose looking section with the tapered walls that says SpaceX, that is the capsule. The cylindrical white section underneath is the trunk, and those are the two that together, capsule plus trunk, make Dragon as we call it. Now each of those two pieces makes a completely different environment for payloads to go up within it. The pressure section, the capsule, is pressurized to atmospheric pressure, and so if you are a customer that requires a payload to be under atmospheric pressure like we experience all around us, it will go inside of the capsule. Now the trunk is exposed to the vacuum of space. It's exposed to a very low pressure environment, so it's unpressurized. If you don't need any pressure, it goes in the trunk. Within the capsule, we have subdivisions of cargo slots that offer different environments. Furthermore, we have polar and glacier, which are two, as their names entail, cold environments. Polar is like a refrigerator, and glacier goes even further to offer cryogenic situations. If you want to do life science or something with cells, you can put it inside of glacier. It will be a very, very cold environment. There's a third for Merlin. The M stands for microgravity, and many more environments that the pressure section the capsule offers. The trunk has three FRAMs, three flight releasable attachment mechanisms, and today is actually the first time that we are flying with all three of those full. Two of those slots are occupied by a SAGE, the thing that Kate mentioned, stratospheric aerosol and gas experiment. The other one houses a huge, huge space experiment for lightning imagery and a ton more. So Dragon has a very capable cargo spacecraft, and we're sending up some cool stuff today. Okay, bear with me for a second here. Imagine it's a mid-July morning in 1969. You, your family, and a few neighbors are crowded, are crowded around a bulky black and white dial TV. On that grainy gray screen, you see a stoic steel structure holding up a rocket that stands six stories taller than the Statue of Liberty. The TV announcer is excitedly relaying launch sequence updates and reports from the three American astronauts on board. 
It feels like it takes forever to get there, but the countdown finally reaches zero and a white glow grows from the bottom of the space-bound skyscraper. That, of course, is what we know today as the Saturn V moon rocket. And that mid-July day was the day that it began the long and historic journey of Apollo 11. Of course, that wasn't the end of the story for this launch site, 39A. Following the Apollo era, the iconic space shuttle blasted off 53 times from pad 39A between 1981 and 2011. Now, fast forward to today, when in just a few moments, our Falcon 9 will lift off on a cargo resupply mission to that same destination as the space shuttles, the International Space Station. With a long history of supporting America's space program, Cape Canaveral's launch pad 39A will once again be the starting point for historic firsts in crewed spaceflight, such as the SpaceX Dragon missions carrying NASA astronauts to the International Space Station. In the future, 39A will also be the launch site for some of SpaceX's first missions to Mars. Now, before we get there, uh, we will also be launching the Falcon Heavy from this site. And there will be some modifi modifications to, this, to the launch pad that we will have to make, including modifications and removal of the rotating service structure. Needless to say, we're looking forward to bringing this hallowed piece of ground roaring back to life. Let's take a look at a video with our director of launch ops, John Muratore. Hi, I'm John Muratore. I'm the director of launch operations here at Pad 39A. We got the keys to Pad 39A from NASA on April 14, 2014, and we started a really radical transformation of this pad. One of the biggest things you notice right away is the big hangar we built because we use horizontal integration for the rocket. And uh, the other big thing that we've done is we've had to convert the pad from what's called a mobile launcher pad concept where the rocket's assembled on a pad or the space shuttle as it was at the time and rolled here with all of its support equipment to uh, a situation where the pad is sitting on the flame trench and we just move the rocket to it, lift and get ready to launch. When you walk on the ground here, this is pretty legendary ground. It is uh, where uh, humans first left to uh, circle the moon, and then eventually the humans first left to stand on the moon's surface. It's a place where the very first space shuttle took off, and over 80% of the space shuttle flights took off from this pad. So it's pretty legendary. And the size of it is what's amazing. 39A is our home for a lot of different activities for SpaceX. It's a home for Falcon 9s, but we launched those out of Vandenberg and over on the Cape Canaveral site. It's going to be our first home for Falcon Heavy. We're going to launch lots of missions there. 39A is where Americans are going to return to space launching from American soil. And we're going to launch um, American crew members on the Dragon on top of the Falcon 9 single core. What's pretty exciting about this place is this place gives SpaceX room to grow. We can put some amazing big rockets on this pad because it's a huge facility. And uh, we're pretty excited about what this is going to bear for the future of SpaceX. We're just under the eight minute mark here at uh, Hawthorne, California, at the World Headquarters of SpaceX, and also at the uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force, uh, Cape Canaveral Kennedy Space Center for Pad 39A, where we're uh, launching Dragon for its uh, 10th commercial resupply services mission. Now, the good news right now is we are still go for today's instantaneous launch window. Uh, we are still keeping our eye on that TVC issue uh, on the second stage. But right now, we're continuing to be go for uh, today's mission uh, from uh, launching from Cape Canaveral. Uh, now, if you've watched our webcasts in the past and our launches in the past, you'll have noticed that uh, in about a minute or two from now, uh, you would see the, the strong back, that's that white structure just to the left of the, structure of the, the rocket, uh, begin to open up and retract away to about a 70 degree angle. Now, this is a new pad for us. Uh, we do update a lot of our systems from time. Uh, in addition to that strong back being able to support the Falcon Heavy rocket later this year, we've also upgraded our retraction method to be a little bit more robust. Uh, and in the past, you've seen that, re that retraction method move away uh, at the 70 degree mark uh, uh, at that T minus five minute point. Uh, right now, what you're actually gonna see is the forward arms open up and we're gonna move that strong back about a degree and a half away. That's our little check. And then the actual retraction will occur at liftoff. So you will not see the actual strong back move away uh, until the, the uh, rocket actually gives a command for liftoff and then you'll see it fall away in just a few seconds uh, from the vehicle. Uh, that vehicle, Falcon 9, is go for today's launch, as I said before. Uh, still looking no issues. We're just finishing off um, 
uh, liquid oxygen load right now. We just finished off the, uh, the refined kerosene RP1 load on the first stage as well. Dragon transition to internal power, no issues to report there. Dragon transitioned about a minute ago. Weather continues to be green. Uh, the range is also continuing to be green. Like I said, today is an instantaneous launch window, so if anything does come up, uh, we would be scrubbed for the day. But for now, we are uh, all systems go from Cape Canaveral and Pad 39A. Now, if you haven't heard, we're also going to be attempting to bring our first stage back to land today, uh, just like in some of our previous launches. So just after liftoff, the Falcon 9 first stage, after it drops off the second stage and the Dragon into orbit, is going to be heading back down to landing zone one. Now, landing zone one is just a old uh, launch pad at Cape Canaveral Air Force Base that SpaceX has repurposed to receive first stages flying back uh, for reusability. Uh, now, SpaceX has the ability to land on either landing zone one or on our autonomous spaceport drone ship fleet. However, there are advantages and disadvantages to each type of, uh, la of launch and uh, landing mission profile. Uh, for example, one of the most obvious benefits of landing at landing zone one is that the land doesn't tend to move around on you when you're trying to bring a stage back to the ground, uh, so it's a lot easier to hit a target that's not moving. There are also advantages in the time it takes to get prepped for a launch. We don't have to uh, spend time deploying an autonomous spaceport drone ship out to the middle of the ocean. And and then, of course, once the rocket's back, it's a lot easier to get personnel to the rocket and save it, and then uh, rapidly get it ready for the next reuse, which is ultimately what we're trying to do here. Uh, however, the autonomous spaceport drone ship also has advantages of its own, mostly in the terms of operational flexibility. Uh, we, we can use just a little bit less fuel during autonomous spaceport drone ship landings because the drone ship can catch the rocket as it completes its parabolic arc through the atmosphere. Uh, whereas if we're coming back to land, we have to spend a little bit more fuel burning the rocket back towards land. Um, there's also just a little bit less operational restrictions with the pad in case there are other rockets around there. Uh, so going forward, we're going to be using either uh, the landing zone or the autonomous spaceport drone ship landing. Um, expect to see both in the future. Uh, one cool thing about today's landing, however, is it's going to be during broad daylight at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, it's looking pretty great out in their cape right now. The last time we landed on this pad was back in 2013 in the middle of the night. Uh, and also last landing, we had video all the way down from the rocket. So today's landing, we should have video from the rocket, beautiful, beautiful video from the ground. It should be a uh, great landing. Uh, so we're actually coming down to the last few minutes before liftoff. We're going to turn it over to the pad cameras and let the rocket do the talking. Go bleed verification. GNC verify stage two TVC motion nominal. Stage one lock secured. Impact fuel bleed secured. Secure 80 and a half degrees. In back, ready to purchase complete. And in back, VTB motions. Stage two lock secured. Falcon 9's on internal power. M1D fuel bleeds complete. Vehicles in Cephalon. Stage 1, Stage 2, Craig, you're going to flight. In back, engine shells complete. VC, verify AFTS is ready for launch. AFTS is ready for launch. 
VCDC verify Falcon 9 and Dragon Iron startup. Falcon 9's in startup. Dragon's in startup. Start start stage 1, stage 2, press up for flight. LD verify go for launch. Minus 30. T minus 20. Hold, hold, hold. Launch board is started. Clock is stopped. CGC, stand by on Pyrex. Copy, stand by. Dragon, verify the Dragon is aborted. And has aborted. Copy that. BC, verify FTS is safe. FTS is saved. Standing by for Sean Beckrace. Well, as you guys uh, all saw today, we, uh, we aborted the vehicle, the launch, uh, about the T-minus 10 second mark. Uh, the call was made by our, our launch uh, team today to uh, abort the vehicle uh, out of an abundance of caution as we looked into the, the TVC issue on the second stage that I mentioned be before. Uh, we saw some behavior that was out of family for what we, uh, we wanted at the time. Uh, and while we may have been able to launch today successfully, uh, we did decide to abort today's mission uh, out of abundance of caution to take a closer look at the issue with our thrust vector control on the second stage. Uh, our backup opportunity, our earliest opportunity for launching again, is tomorrow at uh, 9.38 Eastern Standard Time, so uh, 23 minutes earlier than today's launch. Uh, so that is the earliest opportunity we'll have to, to try again to deliver uh, Dragon to the National Space Station. For now, we are, uh, we are going to hold for the day. This was an instantaneous launch window. Because of the nature of our launches to the International Space Station, we have to uh, time the launches down to the last second so we don't get uh, another opportunity today. Uh, we have to wait for the International Space Station to pass directly over Cape Canaveral uh, until we are able to launch uh, from, the, from the mission. Uh, so as of right now, as I said before, if you're just tuning in with us, uh, we did abort today. Uh, looking into a, a TVC, thrust vector control issue on the second stage. Uh, so for now, we are going to conclude our webcast. Uh, please stick with us. Tune in to uh, our social media channels, uh, uh, Facebook uh, as well as Twitter, uh, at SpaceX. We'll keep you guys updated on when the next launch opportunity will be, as well as checking out SpaceX.com. We'll keep you everybody updated for uh, the latest status for uh, our attempt potentially tomorrow for launching Dragon to the Space Station. So for now, uh, thank you everybody for joining us and we'll, uh, we'll be back soon.